<laughs> All right, people are starting to file in. Uh, we are going to start in just about a minute. If you are here for the webinar, Palestinian Leadership and Liberation, What's Next? You are in the right place. Um, so just be patient for a moment and we will get started in just a few more seconds. All right, um, I'm going to get this started. So welcome. Uh, my name is Laura Friedman. I am the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. Welcome to our event today entitled Palestinian Liberation and Leadership. What's next? Um, some quick housekeeping before we begin. As always, our format today is a discussion between myself and the panelists. We'll be ending promptly at noon Eastern time. So we're gonna be tight as we can. This is being recorded. It's being live streamed on Facebook. Hello everyone on Facebook. Um, I have my own questions. Uh, we also welcome questions from our audience. If you have questions, please submit them via, via the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom window. And I will be keeping an eye on those and our panelists will as well. Don't put them in the chat box. I'm not gonna be watching that but you should be watching the chat box because my colleagues behind the scenes will be using the chat box to uh, put in links to uh, resources that come up during the conversation and other useful things. So use it for that. And also I wanna note that we have um, enabled closed captioning function for those who prefer or need to read rather than hear the discussion. So with that, let's begin. Today, we are going to discuss the current state of Palestinian leadership and how Palestinians are contending with multiple layers of authoritarian rule, Israel, the PA, and Hamas, and how this figures into the quest for Palestinian liberation. Um, I am delighted today to be joined by Inez Abderazek. Inez is the Advocacy Director for the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy, PIPD, which is an independent Palestinian organization. She is also a member of Ashebeka, which is uh, an amazing resource people should know well. Prior to joining PIPD, Inez held advisory positions in the executive offices of the Union for the Mediterranean in Barcelona, the UN Environmental Program in Nairobi, and the Palestinian Prime Minister's Office in Ramallah, where she focused on international governance and development cooperation policies. Um, we are also delighted to have with us Tarek Bakoni. Tarek is Crisis Group's Senior Analyst for Israel-Palestine and Economics of Conflict. His research relates to the contemporary geopolitics of the region with a focus on Israel-Palestine. And his book, Hamas Contained, The Rise and Pacification of Palestinian Resistance, came out in 2018, and everybody should read it. It is fabulous. So with that, we're going to dive right in. I've organized my questions sort of thematically because we want to cover a lot. So I want to start out um, by talking about the concept of liberation. Um, and Tata, I want to start with you. So what does liberation mean for Palestinians? Liberation from whom? Um, does it mean just Israel or does it also increasingly mean the PA? Um, liberation in order to achieve what precisely and for whom? And I, finally, this is a big question, where does today or doesn't the one state, two state debate fit into this question. Thank you, Lara, for the introduction and for having me on, on this panel. And it's wonderful to be here with Ines. And just to say thank you also to the rest of the FMEP uh, team. I think this is a, a great discussion and a really timely one to be had now. So I think in answer to your question, there's a very technical answer and then there's a more philosophical answer. So the technical answer is when we talk about liberation, we really mean for Palestinians to be liberated from structures of occupation and domination that control every aspect of their life. So that's the simplest uh, way to think about what liberation means, to be able to live as human beings in the land uh, of their ancestors in Palestine. Now, that means the dismantling of the system of domination that the Israeli state maintains over Palestinians, whether within Israel itself or within the OPT or also the Palestinians in exile. But it also means dismantling the systems, the Palestinian systems that are used to enforce that uh, occupation, including the PA uh, 
uh, which are which is a, the product of, of the Oslo Accords, as we know, which is a system that has been put in place initially, possibly to lead to statehood, but since then has become a part and parcel of the Israeli occupation and the Israeli military regime. So, in the in the in the most basic sense, that's what we mean, we mean by liberation. But I think there's also a philosophical answer here, and this is something that. Uh, is harder to encapsulate and think about in, in the political sense of, of dismantling occupation or dismantling uh, Israeli domination, which is to say that all the people who are living in Israel-Palestine today are living under a form of apartheid. Uh, and that's not just Palestinians, Israeli Jews are implicated in that system and they are victims of that system in, in different ways, of course, than Palestinians, but they're all implicated in a regime of apartheid. So liberation in essence, means to be able to exist in, in that land uh, beyond uh, that, that form of governance, which is uh, based on a racial, uh, uh, ethnocentric view of the world. So liberation in the philosophical sense, I think, is being able to, for all the people in that land to come into their fullest form of humanity, to be seen as human beings living uh, all, all aspects of their life without prejudice and without oppression. Now, the, for me, the one state, two state debate is a, a side element. It's a side, it's a red herring to this discussion. The, the point isn't now to focus about whether that kind of liberation uh, can exist in one state or two states. The, the point really is in uh, confronting that system of oppression. What political framework that emancipated people, people will then decide to be ruled by is their own uh, thing to figure out in the future. Uh, but, but the debate in itself, I think, has acted as a way to stifle what should be the focus of the struggle, which is um, this, this struggle for liberation. And just the, the final point I want to say is, you know, to what end? You're saying liberation to what end? Uh, it's liberation to the end of self-determination for the people to be able to live in and under uh, uh, systems of governance that are democratic and just and peaceful. And, and that's, that's the point of what liberation is. I think that's the quest that Palestinians are trying to lead in, in the land between the river and the sea. Thanks, Tarek. That's a great place to start. Inez, I want to ask you the same question, the same set of questions. But I also want to ask you to take it in the direction of where you see the Palestinian nation, whether you define that as the people, the leaders, the refugee, the diaspora, or all of those, where do you see them pushing this question of liberation? What, what is the end game and what is, what is the framework in which they are, uh, they, they are thinking about this? Thank you, Lara, and, and really pleasure to be with you all and thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, I mean, to follow up on what Tarek was saying, um, first, uh, you know, it's, it's important to remind that you asked 10 Palestinians of their opinions on what, you know, necessarily emancipation looks like or liberation, and you will have 20 opinions. Um, so it's hard to summarize that there is one way the people think about this. I think what is very clear is that there is a colonial dimension and reality. And I think often um, in the way this, you know, Palestine and the Palestinians has been, and Israel has been, uh, you know, um, imagined and thought uh, over the past hundred years, uh, often we, we kind of tend to erase and, and we have erased the settler colonial aspect of what has been happening. And I think this is very important because I think the, the, the colonial framing can help understand um, what's going on in the, you know, in the in historic Palestine, Palestine and Israel uh, as something that's not necessarily unique in history. And so I think emancipation and liberation is clearly getting free from that colonial domination and from that colonial um, system. And that means that uh, settler colonialism and colonialism creates all kinds of layers of ways people perceive themselves perceive the other. So for example, you have a lot of Palestinians who you know, will end up uh, being obliged to have jobs in the settlements or in, within Israel. And they will tell you, um, you know, if, you, if you ask them point blank, and that's very much of an Israeli talking point, right? 
oh, but you know, they have good jobs in Israel, they, they earn more uh, than in the West Bank. All of that is, is clearly, I think, a symptom of the colonial domination. So you have all kinds of symptoms to that, whether it's, uh, you know, wanting to confront the colonial domination, being subsumed to it, being complicit and kind of becoming part of it as the PA has become. So all of this, you know, is, is part of today of the Palestinian fabric, things that you have to deconstruct in different ways uh, because people have been uh, kind of dominated in different ways and have responded in different ways to it. Uh, but it's all part of that same complex system of domination. And so I think um, it's very different if you ask a Palestinian in the diaspora or in a refugee camp from a Palestinian in the West Bank or a Palestinian in Gaza. Um, and what, what the reality we're living under is, is doing is that it has fragmented uh, geographically, socially, but also has created these layers and tiered system, right, of administration and control over Palestinians that is different, whether you're in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Jerusalem, or a Palestinian citizen of Israel. So um, I would say that eventually for many people today, they see that the first thing we need to do is unify, is this, uh, you know, this importance of unity, that we are one people, that whether you are decide to be a, a parliamentarian in the Knesset or a, a PA employee or or you're completely independent and fighting in a you know in a in a grassroots organization somehow we're part of one people and we need to be able to move beyond these systems that we live under these systems of governance that we kind of have to live with but we need to confront together and as one people and so i think that's that's what I think is, is, is transpiring from today's reality. But I would say that uh, there is a lot of question marks on how would that, that looks like. And I will just end by saying, I think obviously in the past centuries, you know, even us at school and I think in, in, our, in our framing, uh, nation state remains kind of the automatic way of emancipation, right? Like this, this thing that, that the Europeans and the, um, you know, even in, in, in Africa or in many, many continents in Latin America, you sort of had like independence from colonization through the creation of nation states. Uh, but even before that, starting 15th century, kind of people, you know, kind of seeing the nation state as the model. And I think we're in this moment where we have to extract ourselves from that only path. And unfortunately, we're imposed that path by you know, the, the, the current framing, right? Like the two state solution is the only solution or, you know, we need an independent state as the kind of a supposed only solution that would be available. That's a, that's, that's a you, there's so much packed in there that I want to unpack. Uh, I will say one of the most striking things about this moment in time is the, I wanna say, um, the, the greater traction that the framing, that talking about this in colonial terms has suddenly, really quite suddenly taken on outside of Palestinian circles, which opens up, I think, a much more honest discussion about what's happening on the ground than maybe we've ever had. And Palestinians have always talked in those terms, but I think it's finally sort of outside of Palestinian circles in, in large part because on the ground, Israel has, has largely ceased pretending that there is any plan to give up the land and for the Palestinians to have any sort of liberation at all. Um, Inez, I wanna follow up with you in, in pursuing this liberation, however one defines it. Um, a key question that always comes up is leadership, right? You know, who, who leads Palestinians? To what extent today do Palestinians, and again, as you said, 10 Palestinians, 20 different answers, depending on their circumstances, but to what extent do Palestinians in any circumstance see the PA or even the PLO as representing them? And on what is this legitimacy of leadership or lack of legitimacy of leadership grounded? Um, and, and also to some, I mean, I'm curious your thoughts, how this has changed, how, the, how this answer has evolved, right? From the Yasser Arafat era, where there was sort of a general consensus of legitimacy to a proto-state occupation outsourced, you know, outsourced body um, of the PA. How has that evolved over time? Questions to me, right? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so I would say first this differentiate between what, what we mean by leading and controlling. And so I think a lot of Palestinians today think that they have no leaders, uh, they have people who control and who have the power, but that's very different from leading. And as you say, I think since uh, you know Yasser Arafat still had this this aura, this 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 um, I think overall uh, consensus around him um, before Oslo, I would say because Oslo also changed that, but um, definitely, I think the, ma the majority of people uh, today think that they have no uh, leadership and, and, and that the people who control and who have the power uh, that are mainly in the PA because the PLO has been kind of dissolved or fusion with the PA and the, the few people who have power are kind of wear both hats. Um, and so I think, and, and so I think like, yeah, I think people, um, they, do, they do want leadership. I'm, 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 I'm not an anarchist myself. And, and to be honest, I don't think the Palestinians, are, the Palestinians are either. I think they, you know, people want some form of democratic governance, even if they want to have a say in the decision making, they, they want leaders, they want to see that there are people who are kind of voicing their rights. And, and again, voicing their uh, their right to 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 freedom to to liberation um, and so I think that's clearly non-existent um, and and unfortunately again the, the PLO has lost completely um, it's all it's I think it's means and it's it's meaning and I think it's uh, it's legitimacy the institutions are still there but very much uh, emptied and the PA has taken all the all the power uh, but the PA again was also created out of this colonial idea and was is effectively, you know, a subcontractor of the occupation. And so the PA has was supposed to be a temporary administration and doesn't have sovereignty. It's only, you know, kind of administrating services that the Israelis don't want to administer uh, to to uh, to people who are occupied. So. You know, uh, the P was not supposed to be the political address that it has become, and so I think there is a clear need for change, and I think pe most people uh, see that. However, I would still say that we have to be realistic. There is a lot of um, patronal or um, um, you know clientelist or or kind of um, I think again power dynamics where you have a lot of people that are still kind of loyal or are somehow, um, you know, following still this factional, um, the factional politics or the kind of family or, or you know, geographical, uh, I would say, uh, not, not so geographical, but really family kind of oriented traditional politics. So if your uh, father or in your whole family is kind of Fateh, then you you're, you're might be more, you know, attuned to be kind of following still and be loyal to Fateh. Also, because you have this protection mechanisms, like again, you're talking about a, a political space that's very much also uh, corrupt, but corrupt in a sense that people, you know, there are protection mechanisms, and there are somehow all these um, these social um, dynamics that it has created, social economic dynamics that uh, people also have to extract themselves from. Uh, so again, if you ask someone tomorrow, they might just say like, you know, I will follow this, this group, this faction, this leader, uh, because of a very short term uh, interest that they have. So I think that's also one thing that's that we have to extract ourselves from and deconstruct. And I think that's also very much of a challenge. Thank you. And Tara, can I ask you more or less the same question, um, you know, the, the credibility of leadership, who people look to for leadership if they do. But can you also focus on Hamas and how Hamas figures into this Palestinian struggle for, for liberation, including how it secures legitimacy, how it has historically secured legitimacy, and how it seeks to retain legitimacy now that it's in an administrative role, much like the PA? I mean, in some ways, a lot of the dynamics that Ines was just talking about is, are, are replicated in Hamas, the patronage system uh, that that in a talked about when it relates to Fatah and the PLO exists obviously with Hamas and Hamas's membership. So there's very much at the core of it an infrastructure that Hamas has built over the years, even before its establishment as its parent organization, the Muslim Brotherhood had built, that is rooted in 
uh, Islamist social and charitable work that has created networks of families and members being aligned with the movement, almost regardless of the movement's political ideology. So there is that kind of patronage system that exists as a base. But as a movement, Hamas had uh, initially developed its legitimacy, much in the same way that the PLO had, as a movement that was committed to armed struggle, uh, along with other anti-colonial movements globally, to fight a colonial regime, in this case, a Zionist regime or Israel. So it, it derived its legitimacy in much the same way that the PLO had before it. The difference being that with Hamas, that ideology was grounded in an Islamist framing. So the idea was that this armed struggle uh, was also uh, rooted in an Islamist ideology, derived its justification uh, theologically. So not just in terms of its relation with other anti-colonial movements globally. Now, two things happened since Hamas's sort of earliest uh, manifestations and today. The first is that the PLO has shown Hamas what not to do, which is to compromise. It has shown Hamas that if you give up on your right to resist militarily what is a military regime, uh, then you will not uh, benefit. Uh, actually, that compromise is going to get you to lose your power in that battlefield. So in some ways, the PLO and subsequently the PA has shown Hamas the futility of letting go of armed struggle uh, before some kind of political achievement has been secured. Um, but the second thing is that Hamas has now, uh, uh, in its own way, uh, played around and experimented with uh, both administration, as you'd say in the Gaza Strip, uh, but also with what other forms of um, getting legitimacy or getting resistance might look like, including uh, positioning itself as a party that uh, might engage with popular struggles, and we can talk about that in a second. But ultimately, the core for Hamas remains armed resistance. Uh, and this was very clear in May, you know, when we had an episode where uh, Israel and the Israeli authorities in East Jerusalem was for weeks, if not months, before uh, the escalation uh, transported to the Gaza Strip, we had Israeli forces uh, using force against what were generally peaceful protests by Palestinians. Um, when Hamas responded to that using rocket fire, that was a major boost to its legitimacy because Palestinians saw that as finally a Palestinian movement, a Palestinian faction able to defend them against Israeli aggression. And even though you know much of the discourse in the international community was that uh, now Israel has to act in self-defense against Hamas, from the Palestinian perspective, more than 500 Palestinians had already been injured in Jerusalem before Hamas fired its own rocket. Uh, so actually it was Hamas acting in self-defense against Israeli aggression on behalf of Palestinians. Now that formulation means that for Hamas as a military party, it still gets a, a significant boost uh, and, and a boost in its popularity through its use of armed struggle. So regardless of what that armed struggle is for, and we can also talk about Hamas's objectives in, in using those rockets, just in terms of uh, popularity on the street, uh, that is a major wave in which the movement derives its legitimacy, and it becomes even more so when it's compared to the PA, which is explicitly against armed struggle and explicitly committed to security coordination and to the maintaining of uh, Israeli sort of uh, uh, hegemony in the West Bank. Thanks, and that actually dovetails well with what I, where I wanna take this next, which is that question of tactics. And, you know, the when I think about this, you know, one of the things that's striking to me is that the, you know, giving up of armed struggle was basically the deposit. It was the absolutely non-negotiable deposit that Arafat and the PLO made in order to come into a diplomatic process. And I think it, it's striking that the Palestinians, that the Palestinian leadership, the PLO and the PA have stood by that, even as diplomacy and negotiations have actually proven to be a path to losing more and more Palestinian interests, not, not gaining them. Um, Tarek, I wanna stay with you for a second and first talk about Hamas and then Inez, I wanna focus in on the PA and PLO with you. But with Hamas and the, 
the, the refusal to give up armed struggle. But by the same token, Hamas isn't constantly engaged in armed struggle. It's very tactical, right? When they choose to engage, how they choose to use their rockets, what their specific objectives are for when they start and stop. Can, can you talk about those tactics and those calculations and how those play with the Palestinians in Gaza, but also more broadly? Um, you know, I, I think for people on the outside, the idea that Hamas sort of comes in, you know, in a given moment and, and, and engages with weapons, which I mean, shooting rockets into, you know, shooting, shooting rockets into populated areas of Israel, which qualifies as terrorism under international law, no question, you know, doing that and then bringing down the full wrath of the IDF, which is not, again, it's not, that's not a, I don't want to suggest that it just started at the moment of Hamas rockets, but that's how it's seen by the world. How does that play for Palestinians tactically um, when Hamas is looking at its own objectives um, in the Gaza Strip and more broadly? The first thing to say is that Hamas, as, as you rightly say, has always engaged with armed struggle tactically. So the, the point of armed struggle was always to achieve certain goals, uh, much in the same way that Israel uses its own force. And for Hamas, that was deterrence. It was to uh, do two things in, through its use of armed struggle. The first is to deter Israel from carrying out acts of violence against Palestinians, which is the dynamic that we saw in Jerusalem in May. Uh, but the second, and this is an earlier iteration of Hamas's use of armed struggle, specifically around the Second Intifada, was to inflict sufficient pain on Israeli civilians that they force their government to relinquish their hold over the occupied territories. So in that sense, there was a very specific goal for Hamas's use of armed struggle. And through the many iterations that the movement has gone through over the years, that has evolved. I think now there's very much the sense that militarily, actually uh, using armed struggle in the way that it was, let's say, used in the Second Intifada is not going to shift the balance of power on the ground. Israel militarily is a lot more capable. There's no point in, in sort of stressing that. There's, uh, there's no comparison between the military arsenals of both actors, but also that uh, there are other questions that come to the fore, including questions related to attrition, uh, related to the more the morality of using the, these forms of armed struggle um, and and the, the sort of the broader strategic implications of what it means for Palestine and Palestinians for that armed struggle given the very effective framing by Israel and by the West that Palestinian anti-colonial struggle can account or amount to terrorism if armed struggle is is in, in enforceable no is enforced now having said that, Hamas has uh, experimented both discursively and practically in popular struggles. So it has uh, uh, certainly under Khaled Mish'ad openly spoken about its intention to move away from armed struggle and into popular resistance. And under Yahya Sinwar has actively supported popular mobilization, including in the Great March of Return in Gaza, which is the broadest, most uh, politically diverse and one of the most uh, sort of uh, longest sustained uh, forms of mobilization in, in Palestinian history. The response to that were twofold. The international community ignored uh, both Khaled Mishal's uh, readiness to take the movement in that direction and the Great March of Return, which happened with Hamas approval. Uh, but not only did they ignore them, uh, they uh, allowed Israel to respond, certainly in the, in the Great March of Return, uh, using live fire against un unarmed civilians for weeks and framed those responses as self-defense by Israel. So not only did the popular protests not get international support, they failed to shift the balance or the frame that the international community understands what's happening on the ground. It's the, the framing of terrorism still held, even though the protests were peaceful for weeks before incendiary uh, kites and balloons were used and Israel was using live uh, uh, fire against uh, medics and media personnel and unarmed civilians causing loss of life and grave harm as, according to uh, the International Criminal Court. Even despite, despite those international investigations, the framing was still that Israel was facing hordes of Palestinians fighting to break into its border, 
attack Israelis. This was a form of uh, terrorism that was uh, guided by Hamas. So again, the lessons here for Hamas are that actually that form of popular mobilization doesn't work. You know, when Palestinians want to engage in popular mobilization, they're often thinking, and this is where it also moves beyond Hamas. Palestinians certainly uh, those engaged in, let's say, the latest uh, events in Jerusalem often believe that popular mobilization is going to get international support, that if there is an anti-apartheid movement by Palestinians, the international community is finally going to understand what's happening and come down hard on Israel. The reality is not that is very different from that. The reality is that until Israel bleeds, until it faces the harm of military resistance, historically, it hasn't acted in any kind of way that allows for concessions, uh, but also that the international community doesn't notice and doesn't shift. And it's also a misreading of the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa, which suggests that it was driven by a popular mobilization and boycotts and not by armed struggle. So all this to say that for Hamas, but also for Palestinians more broadly, there is a genuine need to understand where military force works, where it doesn't. Obviously, to reiterate the point you said, that it has to be in accordance with international law. And by the way, international law gives the right to anti-colonial movements to use force against violent colonial regimes. So how does military force work? In what effect, what, what are its effects? strategically, but also morally. What does it mean to our process of liberation, as Ines was talking about, if military force is part of the equation? Uh, but those questions are serious questions and they can't just be dismissed by sort of accusations of terrorism. Yeah, I mean, it's just listening to you, I'm thinking about um, the president of Israel referring to Ben and Jerry's pulling out of settlements as economic terrorism. Uh, I think a lot of us for years who have observed that, you know, it, those of us who do not want to see armed who see armed struggle as, as dangerous for both sides and and don't want to see terrorism but at the point when you say well you know economic pressure is terrorism diplomatic pressure is terrorism journalists writing articles that are critical is terrorism everything is terrorism it's sort of like all right we're going to deprive the palestinians of every possible route um, to resist nonviolently, we'll call it all terrorism. And then if they resort to, to armed struggle of any kind, that is terrorism done. Um, it's, 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 um, it, it seems to be a very clear calculation there. Um, so Inez, I want to take the same question to you and I wanna talk about the calculations of PA and the PLO with respect to tactics here. Um, how does, again, we said the PLO and, PA, PLO and PA gave up armed struggle as part of coming to the table, were lauded by the international community for doing so, wonderful, and they've stuck to that, which they're lauded for as well. H how does this leadership strategize about resistance? How does it identify and deploy its chosen tactics to advance Palestinian liberation when we now have decades that showing that, that the tactics that have been left available to them don't, have, don't work? And to the extent that they might have any bite are then called terrorism on anyway. Um, and how does the PA and the PLO, how is it able to, 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 to maintain its commitment to refrain from armed resistance, which I actually think is a good idea, but how does it do that and, and have legitimacy um, when, it, when it's increasingly seen, as you said, as the subcontractor for occupation? I think the question is, do they strategize? I have Clearly, obviously, we all have doubts about this, unfortunately. Um, and, 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 and I was just, all of this conversation just, remind, you know, it makes me think that we talk about Hamas and the PA and PLO, but we have to realize that what's happening now is that Palestinians who very much want also freedom and liberation are not part of that equation. Like the Palestinian citizens of Israel, so the Palestinians of 48 and the, the refugees and diaspora have been kind of ignored, although Hamas has some presence, Fatah has some presence in refugee camps outside. However, they're kind of forgotten in the whole overall strategy, I think, of, of these of the people in power. Um, so I think, you know, the, the PLO and PA, I think the, the, the few people now who clearly have the power, I think it, we're very much in an autocratic uh, system and regime where you have very few people taking the decisions. And 
the both in their discourse and I think in their actions, um, it's very clear that they they are abiding by the status quo, as in uh, collaborating with the current occupation. That includes security coordination. That includes obviously all kinds of coordination because the PA only can exist if it continues to abide by the Oslo regime, which is effectively maintaining Palestinian under the dependency and very much hegemony, as Tariq said, of Israel, whether it, it's for trading, importing, exporting, having water, electricity, you know, the PA buys elect its electricity from Israel, our own water in the West Bank, which comes from an underground aquifer, uh, is, you know, is controlled by Israel, and then Palestinians buy the water. So I think all of these systems in place make that the Palestinians for it, uh, the, the PA for its very own kind of survival needs to abide by the system. So they're kind of trapped in their own domination. And I think the people in power obviously want to keep the power. I think that's their thinking. I think they're very much disconnected from their people, very much so. And um, I think they're, they are accountable to the people who have power over them, which is Israel and also the US and to some extent, you know, the Europeans, although they have a bit less of a of an influence, but it's their it's a major donor. Um, so I think like it's very clear for Palestinians that when Biden was elected, the reactions from you know the Palestinian leadership of suddenly giving signals like we want to go back to negotiations or things like that, again, things that are very disconnected from the political reality. Um, it was a very clear timing. It was very explicit. Um, when, um, again, in fact, like the PA and PLO leadership continues to really repeat that they're ready to uh, talk and sit down with Israel for talks, for negotiations, in, 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 in clearly, whether it's a moment or at least I think most Palestinians realize that having entered that bargaining chip of entering bilateral negotiations, was clearly not going to work because of the asymmetry of power among the parties. Um, you have people who participated in Oslo today. Uh, you know, uh, Khalil Tafakji, he, he's a cartographer and he mapped, and he was the only technical person coming with maps and, and saying, you know, you're not going to have to state with what they're suggesting. But at the end, the Israelis were coming with their own maps and the negotiations were made based on what on the maps that the Israelis were coming with. And things only got worse. So today you have Israel that has all the cards and Palestinians who have none except, as Tariq said, armed struggle, like arms violence. Violence is one of the only leverage that the Palestinians unfortunately have. And so I think we're in that moment where basically the PA leadership knows that they have no legitimacy and they probably have no strategy, but they want to maintain their power and the external influence to maintain that status quo because of the focus on Israel's interest and security is very powerful. Uh, you know, we shouldn't discard that when we discuss obviously Palestinian uh, political space agency or any form of political leadership or, or institutions, you have to look at what's going on in the US, in the UAE and in Saudi Arabia and, and those interests because they are very much influenced than uh, how the, the, the political dynamics are playing. So hold that last thought because I wanna come back to that in a couple more rounds, because that's really important. I want to actually follow up on something you both have mentioned, which is the idea of popular resistance, separate from the leadership. And Tara, I wanna come back to you for a moment and, and talk about this and Inez, I wanna, I'm gonna go back and forth again. So Tara, the, so occupation has been reality for 54 years. Obviously, the, the structures of Oslo have not changed that. In fact, they've actually allowed it to deepen and become stronger, more entrenched, more permanent. So at, what, at this point, what does Palestinian popular resistance, separate from the leadership, look like? And where does the debate stand specifically when it comes to the legitimacy and efficacy of unarmed versus armed struggle against Israel, again, at the popular level? 
And you talked about the March of Return, that's a great example, but, but even more broadly, how do Palestinians perceive, whether you wanna say the advantages or the pitfalls of the various tactics that are available to them as people on their own struggling for their rights? Well, that's a great question. I mean, I think that what, what popular resistance looks like, I think we just need to look at the events of May and June. I think that's in some ways what it looks like. It looks like mobilization in different ways, in different areas. Uh, in some places it's, uh, 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 you know, iftar, prayer, sit-ins. In other places it's protests and mass mobilization. In, in third places it's um, uh, uh, mobs and, and uh, more active sort of uh, forms of uh, engagement and confrontation with Israeli Jews. And so I think that when we're thinking about what popular protests look like, I'm thinking of them as protests or mobilization that's happening on the street level, uh, sort of unorganized organically. I think May, June offers a very good example of what that looks like. Now, there's a lot of uh, things that we can pull out of those two months. The first I would say is that popular mobilization by almost by, by default now, uh, we have to see as breaking out of the structures of partition. So we have to see not as popular mobilization happening in the West Bank or in the Great March of Return, but actually as mobilization that's happening by Palestinians wherever they are as a single people fighting a single regime. Now that was maybe sort of the culmination in May, June, but it's been happening for years. You know, the, pro the land protests in Israel or the land protests in Lebanon, uh, in Lebanon's refugee camps or the Great March of Return, we're all talking about the same thing, which is return. Um, and, and, and fighting Israel's settlement and colonization of Palestinian land. So there's been that kind of popular mobilization happening historically for Palestinians since pre-Israel. And I, I think that that continues to this day. The format of it is clear. Now in that popular mobilization, I think often, and, and this is where I think there's a naivety that comes in, often the sense is that those protests have to be peaceful or have to be nonviolent, or this is the only way that those protests can have legitimacy. And I think that's a reductionist way of understanding the kind of popular mobilization against a regime that is military, militarized and that is lethal. So expecting that kind of popular mobilization to not engage in acts that become uh, violent, either in self-defense or otherwise, becomes expecting the impossible out of that kind of uh, organization or that kind of mobilization on the street level, just by default. And we've seen that time and again during the Intifada, during the Great March of Return. So the, the, the threshold that's put on that kind of mobilization for Palestinians, I think, uh, is, is designed to undermine the legitimacy of any kind of mobilization against either Israel or the PA security forces which act in uh, cahoots with Israel. Now, I just, to, to answer specifically your question, how do people feel about the different tactics? You know, uh, protesters in Jerusalem, when Hamas fired its, its first rockets, uh, I think there were two general schools of thought. The first was this sense of betrayal, that Hamas was now coming in to co-opt what was otherwise a peaceful movement, and this is going to be used for its own factional interests, and this is going to undermine Palestinian achievements on the international stage. Palestinians had already caused the Supreme Court to, renew, to uh, delay its decisions, to reroute the, the march. Uh, the, what Hamas is doing is problematic. The other school of thought was good. There's been 500 Palestinians injured and there's no showing from Israel that this will cease. We need Israel to be slapped the same way that Palestinians are being slapped. And the only faction that has our back is Hamas. And actually there's truth to both those sides. You can argue both ways. And I think personally, I look at this and understand that popular mobilization is one tactic and there isn't a silver bullet. Armed resistance on its own isn't going to work. Peaceful protests on their own aren't going to work. BDS on its own isn't going to work. The ICC on its own isn't going to work. This is a liberation struggle. And by default, it had to be multifaceted. It has to encompass different ideologies and different tactics, all mobilizing for the same vision. So ultimately we need, just in the same way that we need to understand Hamas as being part and parcel of the Palestinian 
liberation movement. So is someone who is committed to an anti-Islamist peaceful protest in uh, Nablus. Those two people can or organizations can be mobilizing towards the same goal. And I think this is, you know, when we think about what popular mobilization looks like, we need to think of it as one form of resistance against uh, Israel. And that needs to be one part and parcel of a multifaceted struggle for liberation. Thanks. Listening to you, I'm remembering I was at an event in Washington shortly after the Egyptian revolution. And uh, a senior US official was saying that the Palestinians needed to take a lesson from Egyptian protesters for their entirely non-violent protest against Mubarak. And they can't throw a single stone or it's illegitimate. That's for Palestinians. And I'm, I'm, I remember raising my hand and saying, what about those protesters who are pulling the rocks up from the road in Tahrir Square and raising them? How come that's OK in Egypt? That's considered unarmed, nonviolent resistance. But if there's a single rock thrown by a Palestinian protesters uh, in a demonstration, it's OK for Israel to use live ammunition against them. Um, there, there's certainly an inconsistency in how this is viewed. Um, Inez, I want to ask you a similar question. I'm interested in looking at the relationship between the PA, PLO, and even Hamas and Palestinian civil society as a, as a sector, right? I'm thinking about, for example, when we had, we saw organized hunger strikes by Palestinian prisoners. They were organized by grassroots um, activists. They were organized by factions that are not part of the leadership. And you saw the, the PA and to some extent Hamas like rush in to try to claim credit because this was an effective tactic. Um, it actually required, it, it pushed Israel to respond and, and release some prisoners. Um, we saw this with the Palestinian outpost in E1 where the civil society you know, gathered and, and, and basically made a statement by showing its presence in, in the E1 area which where Israel wants to build a massive settlement. Um, we seen it with Berlin protests, for example, um, where you know grassroots organizers are doing things, and the PA and the PLO seem to follow um, to try to gain credibility off this. To what extent? It's a long introduction. Is the grassroots civil society organizations leaders seeking to or seeking to or just actively seizing the initiative from Palestinian traditional leaders? And how have things evolved to this point? And and where where does it go when you have such credibility? I think legitimacy at the grassroots level for these actions, and over and over they are led at the grassroots level, not by the PA. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I would say, first, there is not a thing when we talk about civil society, we, there is multiple ways of understanding it. And so I would say that there is, um, there is civil society as kind of grassroots mobilization, what some of the examples you just described. And then there is kind of the civil society that's kind of the one more legitimized, obviously, under and, 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 and that has been pushed and, and promoted under the Oslo regime. That's the professionalization of NGOs and what we call the NGOization, no? Like the, um, uh, the fact that a lot of the organizations have been depoliticized and kind of push to do more uh, peace building work or just apolitical work that basically promotes the idea of state building, of empowerment, all this kind of liberal ideas uh, that fit the international agenda and Israel's agenda. So I think we should differentiate between the two. And, and so I think like obviously, and obviously the, the NGOs part tends to be much more uh, collaborative let's say, or accepting of the current uh, system rather than questioning it. Um, and, and so when it comes to the grassroots mobilizing, it's, it's clearly very obvious that the PA um, uh, leadership, or the, you know, the people again who are in power, uh, any occasion they have to hijack something that's successful, directly challenging and confronting the occupation in Israel, they will try and claim or be part of it, um, be part of the photo op, whatever it is. Why? Because they want to hide, and they still think they can hide the fact that they are complicit, that they do have, again, security coordination with Israel. They sit down with the Israelis, and they just coordinate and accept the status quo. So they have an inherent contradiction in, within our own existence in terms of in their discourse saying that the occupation and 
you know, is, is our major uh, problem, but at the same time, not doing something against it. And so I think they're, you know, they, they, they tend to not, either not say anything or try to hijack those. Uh, the moment that these groups, um, you know, show and, and kind of um, display as well some confrontation with the PA as complicit to that oppression, uh, it becomes a real problem. So we have seen in the past months, right, uh, just I think it was during uh, May as well, there were protests uh, organized in the West Bank in Ramallah and you had the PA very kind of explicitly saying, yes, please go ahead and demonstrate for Jerusalem as long as it remains for Jerusalem. Um, I can't remember the formulation exactly, but it was very clear that if this turned into also, uh, you know, um, um, a protest against the PA also clearly that wasn't doing anything, wasn't, was very silent, was very irrelevant at that time, uh, again, to support people in Jerusalem and elsewhere, um, that would be repressed. And they started blocking the checkpoints, like the moment they saw that this could be problematic for uh, the Israelis, they tried to contain them. So they play very much of a, again, container role and supporter in, um, you know, in, 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 in not challenging the status quo. And I think we're, we're there that we're in this challenge where the past few months show that popular resistance, and as I think as Tariq said, like, is multifaceted. The question is, how does it translate into political organizing? And I think this is where there is a lot of obstacles. And I would say that in popular resistance, also as Tariq said, um, there is those, I think what plays a very big role again is those that are deemed legitimate by the internationals and kind of uh, the, the outside audience, whether it's the international media or the diplomats or the Western governments, uh, and those that are not. And I think this is very detrimental because again, you're told this is okay to do, this is not okay. So you're you're patronized, you're just trying to uh, resist oppression and you're told this is not something that's okay to do. Uh, this is great, let's put the media onto this because we should support that. And so I think that also creates a lot of detrimental influence from within Palestinian civil society where you have those that can be uh, supported and, and you know have an international platform and those that are basically told that it's okay they go to Israeli prisons or that they arrested, uh, you know, uh, in under arbitrary detention or or shot and no one will care because that's just you know that's just not the way we, you should do popular resistance. Yeah, I think this is a key point you you brought it up a couple of times. I think I actually would like to have maybe a separate conversation just on this, which is this the role of international interference in Palestinian leadership, in Palestinian agency, um, and, and the effect that has on, on, on whether you're talking about how the PA and the PLO, how the PA governs, how the PA, PLO leads, what Hamas does. I think it's really, I think it's not just poorly understood, I think it's largely ignored, um, or it's seen as just, you know, this is a fact, we won't even examine it. Um, I'd love to, to dig into that more. So I'm putting you on notice that we want to call you back for a conversation, just focusing on this. Um, we are running out of time. I'm going to ask your forbearance because I want to ask you guys each one more question. So we may run a little bit over. And I have a, a bunch of questions. So first of all, I want to say, feel free to ignore my question and use this last question to talk about what you think is the most important that we haven't talked about. Um, but I'll give you each one just to start off. So uh, Inez, I'm going to start with you. If you would like, um, I wanted to ask you about the uprising against the PA to the extent that that's going on in the West Bank. We've already talked about this in passing when you have both talked about authoritarianism and, and all of that. But I mean, I think it's of interest to people who are listening. Um, but the bigger question I wanted to ask you is this idea that we constantly hear that there is another way, a third way, something you know different than the monopoly of the old guard and where we are now and where we've been. I, I'd be interested in what you think of that framing itself and, and what you, if you see that framing as valid, what you imagine a third way would be. And thought it, you're on top. You're next. It's yeah, this this is very linked. I think this I, this this question of so where is the alternative, right? To the, the main factions or the people who hold the power. 
and I think this is very linked to what we just discussed that a lot of the people are like Palestinians are in, in, in many ways dehumanized and a lot of actors are delegitimized. And I think um, in order for uh, a new Palestinian leadership or movement, national movement, let's say, to emerge, uh, you also need for Palestinians to have their political agency. And I think this is very much what's what's missing is how can Palestinian uh, be uh, able to take matters into their own hands and 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 very much the the international interference is also uh, problematic in that sense because Israel uh, and the PA are trying to let's say kill at birth any form of political organizing. So the moment they see this what Nizar Banat was about. He was, when he was just, you know, uh, demonstrating against the social security issues and, and mobilizing people in the street for an economic issue, that was fine. But the moment that he, you know, he put himself on a electoral list and he kind of created ties with different political movements, he became dangerous because that went beyond just, you know, uh, criticizing. And I think it's okay to criticize today the president and the PA generally and voicing your concern, but the moment they see that you're trying to organize uh, becomes very problematic and the Israelis also uh, are trying to kill that at birth. So when you see the massive arrests of Pal Palestinians from 48, like the Palestinian citizens of Israel, right after the uprising, like more than 1,500 people arrested, intimidated, beaten, that's also to deter. It's a deterrence mechanism so that no political organizing emerges. And so I think we're in that moment where there is clearly uh, uh, people see that both popular resistance and grassroots organizing is some form of answer to the lack of leadership, but that needs to transform into political um, representation that's very hard to reach in a, in, in again, in a system that tries really hard with the complicity of um, you know, Israel's allies and, and also people who are unwilling to question the current paradigm of negotiations and, and, and the Middle East peace process, that they're trying very hard for this not to work and for this not to emerge uh, because they're terrified. They're terrified that either it will be Hamas coming in, in, in place or chaos. And so they're like, we prefer status quo and stability rather than change. And so for Palestinians, they have to, um, I think, fight against that and kind of first trying to remove those obstacles and fight those obstacles uh, in order to even be able to, I think, fight their own, uh, you know, again, the symptoms of all these, I think, internalized uh, colonial issues and, and divisions that are, that are existing within Palestinian civil society and in multiple layers that I think successful political organizing uh, will need. Thank you. And Donna, can I ask you basically the same question, but I also want you to talk about the diaspora. I mean, there's the question of, even if you could think of what it would look like to lead, how do you lead? I mean, Inez talked before about the atomization of the Palestinian polity, and that is a feature, not a bug of, of this era. How, how does a Palestinian leadership emerge, assuming that it could coalesce around something, and, and how does it lead? this atomized polity? What does that look like? Or you I'm can talk about what you want. No, I, I want to answer this question. And I also want to sort of end by linking it to the, the first question around the idea of liberation and, and pull on some of the things that Ines uh, so eloquently talked about. So I think, look, I think in terms of the diaspora, I think it's um, every constituency in the Palestinian constellation has its own role to play. And I think that it has to be a collective movement by the people. And that, that political power that comes into being ultimately has to be able to represent all the different constituencies. There's often a sense by people in the diaspora that because they're not facing the brunt of the occupation or the brunt of the blockade or uh, facing institutional discrimination in Israel, that they are less able to lead. But the reality is, as in as just spoke about the political uh, reality for people to organize and for leaders to emerge uh, within the space of Israel-Palestine uh, is almost impossible. 
by design. And the diaspora in that sense has a luxury. And I don't want to overstate that luxury because in places like the US and in places like Europe, uh, the, the space is shrinking because of accusations of anti-Semitism, because of other forms of accusations that are being targeted against all forms of pro-Palestine support. But there is more relative freedom. And the truth is that many of the people in the diaspora are in the diaspora not by choice. They've been exiled by the same regime that is oppressing Palestinians in the OPT. So in that sense, I think that kind of dichotomy, putting people as in the diaspora or in the OPT, is, is one that we need to break out of. And we're thinking when we're thinking of Palestinians mobilizing no matter where they are, there are single people mobilizing against a single regime. And so one of the questions that I'm always asked is, you know, where is this Palestinian Gandhi or where is this Palestinian Mandela? Where are the leaders that are coming out? And the reality is that there are leaders in literally everything that is happening on Palestine today, but many are being assassinated, many are being imprisoned, and many are not saying the things that the international community wants to hear. But the, the reality is that there is mobilization that is beginning to happen. And there is a form of political coalescing that is also beginning to take shape. It's not the PLO and you know it might never be the PLO. It will be its own form of organizing now um, that, that has its own kinds of characteristics. I think the challenges are great, but I do think that it is beginning to happen organically. The one point that I want to end on though is this idea of liberation. One of the things that Ines talked about is this idea of developing political agency, but also for Palestinians to step out of the layers that they've been colonized under. And one of the things that I'm thinking about these days is what does, what is Palestine and who are Palestinians outside the framework of Zionism? You know, looking at the, looking at the long history of colonization pre-Zionism. So in some ways the apartheid that Palestinians are facing now is one chapter of a much longer history and for Palestinians to effectively be able to liberate themselves is to be able to go back into that history and reclaim that history and be able to, to sort of move beyond it in ways that are rooted in, in decolonization. And so I think for, for us going forward, that is for me at least the, the framing in which to sort of situate the Palestinian struggle for liberation. Wonderful. That, there's so much more I want to talk about with both of you, and I look forward to having you both back and forcing you to talk about this some more. So thank you so, so much. Um, I want to thank my guests, Inez and Thada. You were just remarkable as always. I want to thank everyone who joined us, um, listened in, or watched this event. We are very glad to share this conversation with you. Uh, please check back at the FMEP website, www.fmep.org, for a full list of the resources that went along with this conversation that were in the chat box. Um, it's a great list. Um, you will learn a lot. And you can also check for information about more podcasts and webinars that we are holding. Um, there's great, uh, really good content uh, coming up. Um, well, it's almost every day. So with that, we're going to close for now. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. <laughs>